Hello everyone, it's good to see you. My name is Orestes and in this tutorial we're going to animate a rolling wheel using Cinema 4D. Now even though this concept sounds very simple, it's actually going to provide us some fundamental workflows for dealing with more animations of this type later on. So let's jump into the computer and get started. All right, here in Cinema 4D, this is the effect that we're going to achieve. As you can see, as the wheel is moving, it's rotating accordingly to look like it's rolling on the floor. Not only that, but this is completely interactive. And if I change the size of the wheel, the size of the model, um, the rolling still works properly. So a big wheel rotates less, while a small wheel will rotate a lot more to reach the end, of course. All right, so my goal is as I'm moving the wheel, I want it to rotate in this fashion. So I need to find a correlation between the distance that the wheel is going to travel and the rotation that is going to be applied. Now, if we think about it, one full spin of the wheel is going to uh, be as long distance as the circumference of this circle. Basically, if it makes a full spin, it's going to travel all along the surface of this wheel and end up on the same point, right? In order to illustrate this, I made a little line here. So as the wheel is moving, you can see that when it makes a full 300 degree rotation, it ends up at exactly the final point on this spline. So the length of the spline is going to be equal to one full rotation, right? So let's, uh, let's remove this. And I'm going to delete my, uh, my expression here. So I'm just left with my uh, distance animation. Okay, so I need to find the circumference of the wheel, basically. And if you don't remember the formula, you can just Google it. It's a very easy way to find formulas. And uh, 2 times pi times radius equals the circumference. So let's note this down, shall we? So 2 times pi times the radius. Now, 2 times the radius is actually equals to the diameter, right? So I can simplify this by saying pi times the diameter of the wheel. This is the circumference. Okay, now it's quite easy to get the diameter of the wheel because every object has a bounding box that has a size for every axis and the size of the y-axis here or the x-axis is equal to the diameter of the wheel, right? Okay, so if I select the mesh, basically, I can get the bounding box size here. We can see it's 147.5. I can just copy this value. And now, if I move to the last frame, I can say, I can type this formula, which is pi times paste the diameter. So this is a distance equaling to the circumference. And actually, if I, if I show my little spline here, we can we can see that it's exactly the same. So you can see as it moves, it's exactly equal to the length of this spline, right? Let me hide the circumference now. So I haven't rotated it, but this is the easiest part. I just need one full rotation, if you remember. So let's go to 360, add the keyframe for this, and also add another keyframe at the beginning. And now if I play the animation, we can see it's rolling properly. All right, but this method has a few problems. If I animate every parameter by myself, if I want to retime this, I'm going to have issues because these two tracks need to be exactly synchronized. If I retime the position here and I hit play, we can see that the wheel is spinning now. It's not, it's not um, rolling. I need to animate the other curve at exactly the same um, acceleration which is really difficult to do I can get it close but I cannot I cannot get it 
precisely, right? And every time I want to retime something, I need to go to this procedure, really difficult to do. So timing is going to work against us. For this reason, I'm going to select all the keys here and I'm going to set them to linear interpolation and I'm going to use something different um, to time them. I can use a different one track to retime these two tracks. So let's go to the create menu here and add a special track to this object, a time track. These two tracks here, they have a time track field which I can place this time track I made and now the timing of these tracks is going to be controlled by this time track. So I can retime my time track and this is going to propagate to both tracks at the same time. So now I can say I want it to accelerate and then I want it to move back a little bit and then accelerate again and ease out until the end. So let's hit play. You can see it does exactly that. It starts quickly, it moves a little bit back and then it eases out at the end. All right, so we solved that problem. What about if I don't want a full spin? So now my animation is basically from zero until the full spin. What if I want something different? So let's extend our frame range here. Maybe not so much, maybe 150. And well, now you can see my animation is only until frame 90. If I want to animate partially, right? So I, I want to animate a part of a rotation. It's going to be quite difficult to do with the formula method. Instead, you can select these two tracks and you can choose what happens after after they finish. So instead of constant, which is these black lines over here, I can set this to continue. And then they're going to continue just as linearly as before. And in order for my retiming to take effect, I will add two more keyframes here. So let's add the keyframes when I where I want them, delete the previous one, and then I can keep animating my time track. So after it eases into a stop at frame 90, it's going to accelerate again until the end. So let's see it. It's going to go back, then accelerate, is out. Okay, so <laughs> the problem here is I moved above 100. Uh, basically, the time track is is only working and until value 100, until 100% basically. So let me scale these uh, keys down in order for me to achieve my retiming here. I'm just going to use the region tool by hitting R and I'm going to scale these things down. So let's scale them down until 100 and select the last key, bring it exactly to 100, which is going to bring it at the end of my animation. Basically, 100 is the end of your animation. A, it means 100% of your animation. It cannot go further than that. So it goes back, it eases out, and then it continues and it accelerates at the end. All right, so this is the workflow to do just with keyframes and the timeline. But I think it's a much more difficult way than using expressions. So let's see that now. Let's go back to frame 90. So with expressions, it means I'm going to automate the procedure. I'm going to choose one parameter that I want to animate by myself, and the other parameter is going to be animated automatically. It's going to be driven by my chosen parameter. So as I showed at the beginning, I think it's more intuitive that I animate the position X and have the rotation being done automatically in this case, but I could do the inverse as well. Now, in order to achieve this, I'm going to right click on the position X here and on the expressions, I'm going to set this parameter as a driver and on the rotation B, I'm going to right click and set this as driven relative. And this automatically creates an expression for me. Now, if I, if I move this, it's not animating properly. You can see it's spinning quite a bit more than it should. So let's open our expression and the nodal network it made is exactly what I need 
what I what I'm needing, which is the position x being remapped into the rotation b. Now I just need to put the proper values here. So we can see from 0 to 100 centimeters is going to be remapped to 0 to 360 degrees. Now the rotation I like because it's basically one full spin like we said before. For the position I need to change this to the value of the circumference again. So let's type pi times the diameter which I it's still on the copy buffer and now it should be rotating properly so just as simply as that I greatly simplified how to control this wheel I can animate the position without being worried about timing without being worried about the full spin or anything like that so now I just have one animation track to worry about and I can do whatever I want with it and it's rotating properly. It's even rotating interactively as you can see. Alright, so now that we have an expression we can push it further. We can make it uh, adapt to the size of the wheel, right? So make it fully procedural. Now if I increase the size and I play this animation, let's bring it to the surface as well, you can see it's not going to be rotating properly because this expression is being hard-coded for specific circumference or specific uh, diameter. So I want to make the diameter part of the equation uh, procedural. Now I'm going to do the exact same procedure that I made in order to uh, find what the circumference is. So basically what I did is I selected this object, right? So let's take this object and drag it into the Espresso pool and then I saw here the size of the bounding box. And for this I'm gonna need a new node. So I'm gonna right click and go to the Espresso general category. It has a bounding box node here. So the bounding box is going to give us this parameter but I, I need to tell it what is the object. And this is this object input here. So I'm just going to connect it to the tire. It has an object output and now it will give me this size here. Let's see it. Let's make a result node to see the size. I need to change the result type from real to vector in order to see it. Basically vector is a compound parameter. It has three values inside. So you can see it has 147.5, 147.5 and 67. It's exactly these values over here. So I need to get just one of these. I'm going to use an adapter node in order to get one of these out of the compound. So let's make an adapter node vectors to reals. You see I get one compound parameter and split it into three individual parameters. So let's connect it here. So now this is the diameter right? And I need to multiply it with pi, if you remember the formula here. So two times radius is the diameter and you multiply it with pi. So let's do that. Pi is a constant, so I'm just going to make a constant node. It has some presets here. I can select pi from the presets or type it by yourself and then make a multiply, which is a math node from the calculate category, set it to multiply and multiply these two together. So now I'm getting the circumference out of here. Now because this looks quite a bit complex, more complex than it should be, I'm gonna group this. I'm gonna make this into an X group, okay? Now this X group needs a few adjustments in order for me to get the value out of here. I need to connect it to the output. So I'm going to take this and drag it into the red dot here to make an output port. Let's do this, which is a real type. And I want to see the names of the ports to make it more friendly. So I'm going to right click and on the ports I'm going to show the names. And instead of real, I'm going to name this circumference. And I will also get the radius out of here because I think this is going to be useful. So let's make another port and name this 
diameter. Great. All right. And now I can rename the X group basically, name the X group circumference as well. And I'm going to right click and just make it a standard node. So let's the visualization of it. So now it looks a, a lot more simple. I just made basically a little node manually. Okay, so I calculate the circumference procedurally. So I just need to replace this absolute number with this procedural uh, calculation. So this is the input upper. I need an input upper port and I'm going to connect it to the circumference. Okay, one last thing for me to finish here is when I make this bigger, when I make this wheel bigger, it doesn't stay on the surface. Okay, so I want this to be on the surface. Basically, in order for it to stay on the surface, the position Y needs to be half of the size Y, right? So basically, it needs to be half of this diameter. So let's do that also. Let's make a calculate node another math node. This time I'm not going to multiply, I'm going to divide it. Right, so I'm going to take this diameter value, I'm going to divide it by 2, so let's go over here and divide it by 2. Right, and I'm going to give this to the position Y of the object. So now it will automatically be placed on the surface. So let's Let's see it. If I scale my wheel now, it's going to stay on the surface. And if I move the animation, it's going to animate properly according to the new circumference that it now has. And this is working because it's based on the bounding box, no matter if I change the size of the model or if I change the scale of the model. So now I'm changing the size. You can see the scale is not changing and the animation is still working. And if it's smaller, of course, it's still working as well. And if I change the scale, you can see now it's the scale that changes, not the size. This still works. Finished. Well, first of all, congratulations for making it until the end. I hope you learned something new. And for the next time, we're going to move to a more difficult subject. From a wheel, we're going to see how to roll a cube. This is actually a typical problem in computer animation and it's always interesting to figure out how to do it. It's more difficult, but since you made it through this time, I think you will make it through the next time as well. So until then, keep practicing, keep learning, and uh, I will see you next time.